Check, check. Are we on? All right, let's uh, start with some announcements. We got some. I believe we have some guests here. Here, come up front, Mike. Hey guys, um, I'm John Michael Rochelle. I graduated from here a couple years ago. Is that me? Yeah. Um, and basically, I play in this band called My Name is John Michael, and uh, myself and Travis from Volnado.com here, we've done a little bit of a partnership with regards to digital media creations and content producing. And basically, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, I should say, uh, I'm jumping into the studio for two weeks with Raymond Richards, who produced like, local natives, uh, Henry Clay people, Honey Honey, a bunch of different stuff. And basically, we're going to be in the studio for two weeks. And what I was hoping to get from one of you guys, I know that the end of the year is here, and some of you might be looking for intern credits. And I talked to Snyder, and he said, if, you got, if anyone is willing to do it, basically come into the studio, be a part of the process, be a fly on the wall, take pictures, video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so we don't have to do it. If you're, uh, and come see me or Travis, the gentleman in the blue collared shirt right here with the afro and the mustache, um, and come talk to us after forum and hopefully we can make something work out. Hope you guys are well. Y'all doing all right? Good, good. Cheers. Uh, it's also worth knowing that the center is going to have some internship opportunities. Uh, anyone looking to stay in the city um, can get paid to do video training uh, and some other training. We need some people to uh, help man the ship next year. So if that sounds good, uh, send us an email at Get Informed or talk to me or Hillary afterwards. Uh, other announcements? I got an announcement. Okay, guys, this Friday, Cafe Britannia, you're gonna see me out there, and I'll let you know. It's gonna be a party. There's gonna be three bands and a DJ. We got Nomad playing, Yo Jimbo, 27 Lights, and a DJ set from Paradigm. It's all for $5, and they're gonna be drink specials. Starts at 9.30, so y'all should come out. Right on. The Thursday show. night, guys, we got a Costa Rica benefit with E Company, Newgrass Country Club, and City Lark. Tickets are $10. All benefits go to the uh, volunteers for the Costa Rica help. So uh, come on out, support the world. Some shit is happening in the world right now, all kinds of tsunamis. Come on out, $10. If you want a ticket, come to me. Uh, I think Pete Campanelli might have some too from Newgrass. Hey, I'm Nigel from Simple Play Presents. We have a uh, really busy April coming up. We have Lyrics Born at One Eye Jacks next Monday, Zugma, Ear Funk, and Greenhouse Lounge next Thursday, and Lotus and Eskimo on the 28th. So come on out. What day was it? It's Saturday, April 16th. April 16th. Right on. Hi, announcing? everybody. Um, my name is Kimberly McMillan. I'm with Sigma Alpha Iota Music Fraternity for Women, and we're going to be having our musicale on Sunday, April the 10th at 8 o'clock in Satchmo's. I'll be performing Emily McNamara, um, Hannah Baldo, um, and some other great people that are in the College of Music that have decided to pledge SEI. So come out and support us. It's free, and you might be put in a raffle to win a $10 iTunes card. April 10th. Other announcements? Yeah. Uh, Pat. Hey, uh, I'm Pat Sundell from City Lark. We're, like uh, you just said, we're playing on Thursday night with E-Company and with Newgrass Country Club at Britannia, and that's for a really good cause. But if you can't make it out, uh, you should stop by the Peace Squad on Friday afternoon for Loyal Palooza, I think it's called. And we're going to be playing in the Peace Squad, and it's going to be rad. So check it out. Right on. Hey everyone, here's another wonderful announcement about Nola Sound. We're still looking for some bands to help us out. We'll buy you pizza, new guitar strings, we'll record you, I don't know. We just need your help, so please email us at nolasound at gmail.com and what we'll get band together doing? and do something. Let's do that. Let's get bands there. Let's do it. Mississippi Rail Company did it, and you know what? It was awesome. Thank you. Any other announcements? <laughs> Very passionate about Nola Sound, I'm sorry. 
Uh, well, uh, Mississippi Rail Company, my band, has a show April 16th. We're playing at One Eyed Jacks with uh, Lost Bayou Ramblers. Woo! If you have not heard them um, and you like Zydeco, uh, you're an anomaly. So, so let's change that and come out to our show. And there's rumors, uh, there's rumors that the givers are going to be sitting in with us. So uh, if you're down, come and check it out. And uh, I believe I have one more announcement. Yeah, uh, next week for Forum Guys, uh, Hal Gunn is coming to the Sing and Talk Matter. He's actually a really good friend of Billy's. So uh, come out, tell everyone you know to come out. If you're a musician, if you're going to be dealing with musicians, which, let's be honest, is all of us, it's definitely worthwhile to hear. Uh, so next week, Forum, same time it is always. And uh, this Thursday, you should be getting an email blast about it. Actually, click the links. They're really worthwhile. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started on this Get Informed. Please join me in welcoming your own Professor Bob Rainey. Please hold your applause. Uh, I have a, a, a boring announcement to make very quickly. Uh, it came to my attention today that advanced multimedia production is actually listed as being available in the fall. And since many of you will be registering very soon. I wanted to let you know that it won't be available in the fall, and you shouldn't register for it in the fall. Please hold your applause. You can register for it in the spring when it actually will be offered. Okay. So it's not going the way of the dodo, but it won't be available this fall. All right, now to the good stuff. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about John Mueller when he comes up and tells you about what he does and what he's thinking, and then when John Paul interviews him. I just want to say very quickly that uh, John is what we call a creative. He's an artist with a capital A. He has visions, and he follows those visions wherever they take him. And over the years, they've taken him to some pretty interesting places. Uh, but he's not an artist who lives in a vacuum. He understands that uh, the creation of art and music is a social thing, and that there is business attached to it as well. And he spent a lot of his life balancing that artistic impulse and the need for business, and seeing the creativity in both sides of things. Now, a lot of artists do that nowadays, but not a lot of them think about it as deeply as he has. So I hope that he'll give you the chance to see what's creative about business, and what's business about art, and what the social connection between all these things is. Uh, give him a big hand. It's John Mueller from Milwaukee. Okay. Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. Thanks, everyone. This is my first time to New Orleans. Uh, it's a great city, and it's exciting to see all of you so involved in, in music. Is it true that you're all in the music program here? Yeah. Okay. Well. Like Bob said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I'll try to get through this all as quickly as I can. Then I'm going to sit with John Paul, and he's going to ask me some more in-depth questions about what I do and what I think. But I think you need a little bit of background first, because my background is a lot different than the path that you guys are on right now. As opposed to going to school for music, I got my undergrad in English. And then I went on to do a bunch of jobs that were incredibly horrible and not related to music at all and soul crushing and all that. <clears throat> and I did music on the side. And while that's great, and I think that's what a lot of people do, that's maybe what some of you will end up doing, um, what I want to share with you is that it doesn't have to be so black and white. It doesn't have to be this world that you live in where your creativity is funneled all into one place um, and the rest of your life is miserable and, and unfulfilled. Um, I guess what I started uh, thinking about is what creativity means to me and um, how I can apply it not only to music but to other things that I do. So early on I thought about creativity just in terms of this artistic strategy or artistic work that I would do. So anytime I would want to do something creative, you know, it was this, uh, you know, just typical uh, artistic practice. Um, I guess over time when I started to realize that you know it's not just about music or it's not just about art, I do have a background in visual art as well and, and film. Um, creativity is really about 
being in one place and getting to another place. So as you see on the slide here, an island is a good example of that. I mean, how do you get out to that place? You have something that you want to do. You have some place that you want to get, be it you want to write a song, you want to go on tour, you want to become a rock star, you want to do whatever it is that you want to do. How do you get there? Um, that's really what creativity is. And the more I started to think about that and understand that, um, creativity is really a, it, it's a, a problem solving process. And once I understood that it was about problem solving and less about artistic activity, um, that opened up this whole other world to me. It opened up this world where I could think about, okay, uh, how can I solve other problems using creativity? You know, how, how can I go and do something? How can I serve a function in the world? Because that's really an important part of you know, what you all have to think about too is, how can you be a, an active member of society and solve people's problems for them and help people um, and do that creatively? So that's one part of it. Um, and that, was, that, that really was uh, a, a big change for me in, in thinking of that. Um, not only did that help me think differently about music and what I did with music, but it, it helped me think about how I could uh, you know, maybe work in other situations too. So I guess instead of having uh, these soulless uh, jobs that I was miserable with, I started actively looking for situations and opportunities where I could help people out on my own terms and not just get a job to pay bills uh, but do things that were interesting to me that, that also helped people. So creativity was a, a part of getting to that point for me. Um, we'll probably get more into details on stuff in Q&As, but I just want to give you guys that as background. The bottom line is um, really making something interesting happen, either whether it's work that you're doing for yourself or for other people. Um, so if there's a place that you want to get so you have your island, so to speak, how do you get there? And I, I feel like the process of getting to that point is where the real creative element starts to take hold. So as you can see in this slide, if you're here and you want to get uh, to the other side, there's a lot of distractions that can come in between you. So what are those distractions for each of us? Um, you know, time, uh, friends, social commitments, anything that's going to keep you from doing the work that you want to do. But really, I would encourage you to explore some of those distractions and, and stop and look at some of those things along the way and, and find different things that can inform your work and inform what it is you do um, without being directly associated. So for instance, um, don't just be involved in music. Get involved in other things because it's a big world out there and a lot of stuff that is non-music related has really informed a big part of what I do musically. So it's really been an important part of, of my process. Um, you know, that can apply to all sorts of other things too. So a lot of you were mentioning in the announcements uh, having events and things like that, which is great and it's essential. I mean, performing music is a big part of what you have to do. But how can you do those events differently? Uh, John Paul and I talked a lot about this earlier and maybe we'll get back into that too. But events, I think, are, are a big part of what this industry is going to be sustained by going forward. And if we all keep doing events and music the same way, um, interest isn't going to last. And it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be interesting uh, for people if, if millions and millions of people are doing it the same way. So think differently about it. For me, it was also about thinking differently about my instrument. Um, I guess I skipped ahead a bit. Um, I've been a drummer and percussionist for 25 years probably over that now. I'm older than I think. Um, but at a certain point, I thought, you know, I like this instrument so much. Um, what else can I do with it besides just playing it like a drum kit? Um, and so that opened up all these other ideas and thoughts of how I can work with percussion in a way that hasn't been taught to me, uh, in a way that, that isn't taught in schools, that isn't taught um, in books and isn't played uh, by anybody else. How can I come up with my own way of doing it that's different from everybody else? Not just for the sake of being different, but for making something personal um, that really is about me um, communicating with the world. So forget the obvious choices. Whatever path that you're on um, to get from point A to point B, try to uh, think about getting there differently, um, trying different things out. Um, experimentation is good. Uh, because you're, you're in a creative industry and it's almost demanded that you, you think that way. Um, 
I would also encourage you to be flexible too. You know, if, if the road is, is packed, uh, don't give up. You know, I, I've, I've known so many people through my life who, when their band didn't make it, they sold their instrument. And it was really always sad to see people do that because it made me feel like, well, what, what did you really care about it to begin with if that's all that you're investing in it? So be flexible and be patient and uh, do good work and um, that's all you can really do and don't give up. I think another part of, of getting through this process is this idea of things that can happen. So instead of being able to take a straight line through something, you know, say whatever goal it is that you want to achieve, um, if it's not an easy route to get to that goal, um, it's okay because there's all these things um, that are sort of these adjacent possibilities that once you kind of go exploring and, and, and collaborate with people and try different things out, you're going to discover that these possibilities exist um, within all these distractions that, that you can notice. Um, there's this author, Stephen Johnson, um, who has a, a really great book out called Where Good Ideas Come From. And in that he says, the strange and beautiful truth about the adjacent possible is that its boundaries grow as you explore those boundaries. Each new combination ushers new combinations into the adjacent possible. So every little distraction or change that occurs within your process of getting to what you want to do creatively opens up all these other possibilities that you didn't know were there. Um, I wish I could come up with a, a clear example of that without getting on a 20 minute tangent, but um, maybe we'll get into some specifics with that. But it's, it's, if you want to say, put out your next CD and you say, okay, well we have the means and technology to do that. I can certainly go and press up a thousand CDs very cheaply and easily. You can certainly go and do that. But what if somewhere within that process you found a different way of doing it that involved other companies, other artists, other people in other disciplines that you could involve in that? That would totally change the picture. And within that picture changing, that opened up all these other possibilities of things you could do where all of a sudden you realize, I'm not going to put a CD out. I'm going to go do a soundtrack for this film that this guy is producing because now I've opened those doors and I have those possibilities. So again, it's not just being so focused on what's straightforward, um, being open to uh, possibilities around you. The next thing I want to add is just uh, the collaboration factor. Um, I think a lot of those possibilities really come up when you work with as many different people as possible and people outside of, of music, per se. Um, collaborations, for me, are almost fundamentally responsible for Anything that I've done musically that has had any type of financial payoff or um, you know, very uh, personally successful, rewarding projects that I've worked on. Um, so for instance, most of my life I've done instrumental music. And this opportunity came along to work with someone who was a vocalist. And I thought, wow, you know, this is something very different for me. That might se not seem like a big deal. Um, but for me, it was. I'd never worked with a vocalist, really, with music. So um, we tried some things out, and it went great, and it worked out. And little did we know when we were collaborating on this that years later, um, this person would start this band called Bon Iver, and we would have a record out and sell 25,000 copies of a record. So those are the kinds of things that can happen when you try something different, just for the sake of seeing what else is possible. Um, film stuff, like I mentioned before, too. I think there's a lot of possibilities now because of the nature of the film industry and how a lot of independent filmmakers are in similar rooms right now, like all of us here, talking about the same kinds of issues. So there's this big pool of, of uh, people in the creative industry that are looking to try new things and, and see what the possibilities are. Um, because of that type of community that's developing, um, I think in general, business is sort of changing um, in terms of how we do things. Now, the music industry is, is just kind of interesting in its own right in how it functions and how it works differently than most other industries. But um, what's great about it is this kind of grassroots feel to it and, and the way it works. So, you know, we don't have offices, we don't have companies and HR staffs and administrators and things. Um, business for us is really done on the fly. And what's cool is that that's starting to happen in the business world too. Um, and why that's cool is that 
I think that's going to open up more possibilities for people to do stuff with their creative work that hasn't been possible before. There's this other guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, who I don't know if you've, well, wrong slide. I missed one. <laughs> but let's, let's just look at this for a little bit. Um, this guy, very, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, he wrote a book in the past called Crush It, which um, is a great book about social media, if you guys haven't heard of this. Um, it's worth checking out. But he has a new book out called The Thank You Economy. And uh, a quote from that book I just want to read you is, how we cultivate our relationships is often the greatest detriment of the type of life we get to live. Business is no different. Real business isn't done in board meetings. It's done over a half-eaten plate of buffalo wings at a sports bar or during the intermission of a Broadway show. Now, we might want to substitute sports bars and Broadway shows for our own experiences, but the fact is that that's really true. And I, I think that speaks to you know, the world that we live in, is that you know, we're announcing our shows at, at forums like this. And that's business. You know? You're inviting people to an event where there's possibly a transaction that occurs. Um, and so that's the cool thing about being in a creative industry. And it's cool to see that. Uh, the business world at large is, is taking note of that. As we'll, we'll get into things tonight, I think there's a lot of things that the, the music industry isn't learning necessarily from the business world that it could. Um, the final thing I want to mention, uh, just as background, how can I get rid of this little thing here? OK. Um, I, d I, I can't stress enough how important it's been for my focus uh, to m help people um, and make them happy with what you do. Now, that for the people that know my music, or some of it at least, making people happy is probably a gross uh, irony. But um, it, I think it's really important in, in how you do that. And so maybe it's not you know, artistically what you're doing that's going to make people happy necessarily. But, but it does in some way. But in a bigger way, it's how you treat people in the process of, of how you work with them, even if you don't see them, even if it's just something you're putting out there that people are receiving in some way, whether you play a concert or um, you know, release a record or something. Um, I think it's really important now to not just talk about yourselves and the work that you're doing, but find opportunities to share your interests in what other people are doing. Um, we talked, John and I talked a lot about this, and I, I think we will get into that. Um, I think people are getting tired of, of hearing about what everyone is doing creatively. And so if you're just talking about that all the time, it just, it's going to end up burning people out, and they're going to stop listening. So creating opportunities for other people um, is, a, is a great way to not only support the work that you're doing and kind of build your audience because you're, you're uh, bringing other people into the fold who then might talk about your work as well. But it's just great to support um, other people's work that you're interested in, because in turn, you're kind of building these communities around what you're doing. Um, and I, I know you all understand the importance of that. Um, I think just you know, if, if there's any way to be thankful for the opportunities you get. I, I think as musicians, a lot of what I've seen is people get opportunities, and um, they sort of take it for granted, like, oh, you're flying me to this festival in Paris. Uh, that's great. You know, thank you. And I'll come there, and I'll drink all the beer, and I'll make a mess in the, the back room, and you'll be happy to pay me, and I'll be on my way. I mean, I think that just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, what's really interesting is that companies in the world spend many, many, many thousands of dollars on building customer satisfaction programs into whatever it is that they do. And artists, people who are creative, who actually have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with their customers sometimes, don't really think about that too heavily. They don't, are, you know, in general, and I'm totally generalizing, but I, I, from what I've seen, um, people aren't so concerned about um, making sure that their customers are happy. So. If somebody gives you an opportunity, um, just be sure to thank them in a unique way that they'll remember you. Because even if you don't fill all the seats at the show, but um, you were way cooler and nicer and just better vibes all around than the band that sold the club out but were total assholes, they're going to call you to come back. Um, they might call the, the other band back too. But 
it's better to be the person that's kind of on the high road, I think. It's going to open up more doors for you in the future. So that's kind of my philosophical background, and I think we can get into some questions now. All right, John, we got a lot of questions. Okay. Covered a lot of ground. A lot of things are going through my mind. A lot of things are going through a student's mind. Um, I want to start with I want to start with uh, with how this sort of paradigm and thinking affects us. I mean, we have many creative students who are always putting out albums, having shows, and see uh, and experience their career as an event, an event, an event. These sort of uh, very linear, um, this is what I'm doing now from a creative standpoint. What are some ways that you have broken that mold, and what are some ways you can encourage other students uh, to maybe um, see their brand a little bit larger? Well, I think I just would elaborate on kind of what I brought up about involving other people. I mean, I think what we've all experienced with sh social media is that you're, you're basically trying to build a community around what it is you're doing. And I think a way to not do that effectively is to just have it be all about your shows, your records, um, your this, your that. Um, I think a good way to do that is to kind of try to paint a bigger picture around who it is that you are. Because if you think about it, people first are interested in your music. And that doesn't mean you have to you know, become best friends with everyone that likes your music and have them for a sleepover or something. But Though you should, right? No. Just kidding. No, right. not at all. <laughs> but seriously, um, I just think that y there's, there's this great opportunity now with the technology that we have to kind of be small publishers in our own way and talk about all the things that inform the music that it is that we make. And not only that the music that we make, but what other stuff that we like that, that's currently happening that we think is cool. So, you know, I mean, again, back to the announcements tonight. I mean, some of you are talking about great stuff that happened before, and now you're going to do this again, and it's going to be even better. And I mean, so who are those people in, in your communities that, that you think are doing good stuff, and, and how can you help highlight what they're doing? Um, I ran a record label for 10 years, and... Um, through part of that, I tried to, well, I didn't try. One of the ideas that I had for it was online was to create kind of this magazine aspect to the website and have it be less about just announcing what records I was putting out, but um, interview artists and, and feature uh, writings from artists, non-musical writings, just kind of fiction and, and um, other things that uh, were just interesting. That, you know, if at least from my perspective, if, if I'm really into what someone's doing musically, I think it's even more interesting than to find out kind of what makes them tick, like what they're into, like what, what other kinds of stuff they're into. Because they're, those are like the secrets. Like that's what everybody always wants to figure out. So you have these, you know, the mega, the mega stars. I mean, that's why, that's why everybody's so interested in dirt on people, you know, like big celebrities, because they want to find out like what's making these people tick that allows them to go and create this stuff that, they, that, that people are, are so excited about. So taking a positive approach to that and not having it be about, you know, sordid weekend debauchery or something, um, you know, getting an insight into what, what uh, interests the artists that make the work that you do. So kind of getting some of their ideas and, and hearing about what they do. So um, I started that with the label. And then um, when I closed the label, I had my own website. And I thought, I really was uh, concerned that I wouldn't have the opportunity to do this anymore, what I was doing with the label. So I thought, well, why can't I do it with my own site? I mean, I'm a person, and I have interests too. So it doesn't have to be just about me. It can be about all this stuff. So I kind of came up with this concept like, OK, if I'm not going to have a site that's you know, johnmuller.net anymore, it's going to be this other thing. You know, what, what is it that, I, that I'm you know, really about as, as a musician? And so I kind of thought about my philosophy and my perspective on the music that I make and, and what function that serves, um, how I work with sound and, and uh, 
kind of the, the more acoustic side of things and how uh, acoustics can affect um, each person's experience differently with music. So I thought, okay, there's, there's my ground point. Like that's, that's kind of what this site is going to be about. And from there, it just, in my head, it opened up all these doors like, okay, now that means I can talk about other sound artists, I can talk about acoustics, I can talk about acoustic phenomena, I can talk about, you know, I can link to scientific research on, you know, how some of this stuff works. And so, again, it wasn't just about like, I have a new CD out, I have a show Friday, I have this, I have that. It was like, let's paint this bigger picture. Because in the process, what could end up happening, you know, ideally at least, is that I'll end up getting people coming to my site who have no idea that I play music, that have no idea of, you know, what I do. But now they're going to find out about it. And so that's a much nicer way of marketing than running around, you know, yelling to everyone that I have a new CD out, which is just, you know, old. Uh, for those who don't, for those who, uh, who aren't quite here yet, I suppose, what we're talking about is an organic way to, to find out your brand, to find out uh, things that resonate with you and that your community can sort of hold on to in a larger scope than just your music. Um, now, the site that you're talking about is your own site, um, Rhythmplex, which started off as, as a, your own site, but is now this, this, much, this much larger project. Um, how, uh, how have some of your other experiences with uh, various forms of social media influenced um, how you communicate with your audience? Well, it's hard to say. Um, I guess in some ways it's kind of narrowed it. Um, for instance, I, I canceled my Facebook account recently, which was <gasps> this weird thing. Well, it's so right. I mean, it was a weird thing because instantly all these people started emailing me saying, you know, what, what happened? You know, and just, Are you all right? <laughs> yeah, just the idea that that caused that much of a, of a, of Shock a reaction, in the system. it kind of made me really question, like, what is this thing and what? Why is this so important to people? And what, what does it really mean to people? And um, so that, in kind of a negative way, affected my thoughts on you know, how we're communicating with each other. The, the, the problem I was having with Facebook is that um, you know, I'm not against it. I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing. I just felt like I didn't really know what its purpose was for me and, and how I was using it. And it was just turning into this kind of garbage dump that I always, or that I ended up viewing MySpace uh, as as well. So I thought, you know, it, it, like all things, um, you know, if, if you just got into a conversation with someone and just started talking about all this random nonsense, you know, the, the person you were talking to isn't going to hang around very long. So I, I, I just feel like some of these platforms are just indicative of that. It's just a, a great place to spend hours on meaninglessness. And um, I'm just not into that, you know. Right on. Uh, you spoke earlier about some things that the, the artist, the, the musician, can learn um, about their communication from businesses, especially businesses that are spending their resources on customer satisfaction. Uh, what, are, what, are some of those, what are some of those things that we can get hip to? Well, I mean, that's really the main thing. Um, is, there, is there something in particular that well, um, you, you spoke thinking. about a label that you've worked with. I guess which is not really a business; it's still in the music community. But uh, there's uh, a label. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think this whole idea of community is is a is a big deal right now. And when I say big deal, I mean it's really the opportunity that we all have um, to do anything with our creative work. Is this idea of building a community? And so, I think um, there are certain very creative entrepreneurial people who are involved on the industry level, who have record labels, who are in the business that are doing things a little bit differently. I mean, you still have to do what you have to do, and you're still producing a product and you're selling it for money. But um, there's a, a particular label um, called Home Tapes in Portland that I think is doing some really interesting stuff in terms of kind of the background. I mean, when you see them, like, if you all went and researched them now, you would see that, okay, it's, it's a record label, big deal, you know. 
and that's fine. But behind the scenes, what they're doing and how they're working with the people that they work with, it's really kind of an interesting process. And it's, it's almost cult-like in some ways. I was telling John Paul a really interesting story uh, before that I'm not going to get into now. But it, there's, there's something about you know, how you decide and choose who it is you're going to work with that's really important uh, now more than ever. And I think our ability to kind of create communities around what we're doing will help identify those people easier than it was in the past. And so why that's important is you're going to have way less stumbling blocks and you're going to make less mistakes because you're going to be aligned with the people that you really know are the good people. Um, Zach and I were talking earlier about the importance of when you're, if you, have a, if, you, if you have a band and you're not playing with people who totally get it, and when I say get it, I think you all get it. If you're not playing with people like that, it's just the music is not going to go to the level that it could go. But when you do find those people, and you can't put an ad out for those people, they're not going to, you know, you, you just can't. If you want to find those people, it's hard to find them. Um, but once you find these people that you, you're really kind of tuned in together, um, something really, really great happens with the music. And likewise, in business, it's the same thing. So when you align with people that are really kind of on the same page, um, that's when really powerful stuff happens. And I think labels like Home Tapes really, really get that. Um, to a, a very high degree. So for them, it's not so much about like, oh, your band has sold a bajillion records. We'd love to put out your record. Thank you very much. It's less about, hey, that's cool. Congratulations. But you're not in our cult yet. So thanks anyway. Goodbye. You know, I mean, it's, it's like this kind of um, process that you go through that you, you just kind of make sure that everybody's dialed into the same thing. And that maybe sounds ambiguous and weird. And um, if anybody from Home Tapes ever sees this, I apologize for putting you through the ringer. But it's, as an outsider's perspective, I think it's something really important. And I think um, it's indicative of kind of how the, the musician works. And to see like a label kind of reflecting that and see other uh, very small labels um, who are now growing to um, bigger degrees, which Home, home Tapes is, is doing, for example, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's cool. And I think it's kind of indicative of what's going to happen. When we talk about um, releasing CDs, releasing content in new ways, um, this is something that can really let an artist stand out. If you can find a way to, um, to give your content to your core audience in a meaningful way, uh, you stand a chance of, of really fostering loyal listeners, loyal consumers for a really long time. Um, from your experience, have you found any releases, any physical releases? Um, you, don't, you don't download much. You're really into the, the physical collection. Have you found any, any examples of some really interesting physical distribution that sort of cultivates this community? Well, I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with the idea of making something unique that you would sell at your show or something like that. I, I think it's just important to always have something a little bit personalized and special for people. And that's not to say that everyone's going to buy and you're going to sell you know, tons of these. But I think it's just a good way to kind of establish that relationship with people and say, you know, your interest is important to me. And so in turn, I'm making something special for you. And you're going to buy it. But I'm making something special for you. Um, it just kind of strengthens that connection between someone's interest and, and what it is you're doing. I, I'm also super, super into the idea of like, not even having releases at all. Like I, for a while, I had this idea of starting a band that didn't put any music out at all and just played shows and composed songs. Um, so not improvised music, but composed music, but having every show be a totally unique set of composed music. And that was just powerful as hell. And so that you would end up possibly gaining this audience by just this attraction to Here's your one time to see this music, and it will never be performed again. And it's going to be at this, you know, it's they're performing it Saturday night, and this is the only time you'll ever be able to see it and hear it. And these are the sort of ways that the artist informs the businessman, and the businessman informs the artist. We see in sort of thinking outside the box of how we're going to, you know, promote our music. Uh, that sort of has a little bit of synergy to it. Yeah, I mean, it's. Companies every day are coming up with goofy things to bring to the world, and we're all doing the same thing essentially. You know, so how 
how can we think about what, what are some ways that we can think of doing that action differently? Right on. Uh, now, you spoke briefly that, that you started a label and you, you spent uh, a good part of your career working a label. Uh, what was that experience like for you? What are some of the questions that people thinking about starting their own label should know about? That's really hard to answer because I feel like when I ran the label, which started in 1999, ended in 2009, I, I mean, times, even, even that wasn't that long ago, but it, just things are changing so quickly that any issues that I had then may or may not even be relevant now. And every label is so different in terms of how they work. I released mostly stuff that was very kind of labor-intensive, hands-on, custom packaging, weird deluxe editions and wooden boxes with different smells to each one. And I mean, seriously. And would create only a few of these and sell them for a very high ticket price. But, um, you know, nobody, I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was just really what I was into. Like, I, as you mentioned, I'm a record collector, so I, I mean, I'm just into stuff that's interesting like that. And so I wanted to do that and not just be a, a collector of it, but create it as well. So, um, you know, I, I think starting a label right now is just kind of a weird thing. And I, I think that it's almost better to pursue labels that you think are really good and, and just kind of use that as a goal to focus on. You can certainly release music very easily yourself. There's no maybe need to start a record label around it anymore, which is there was when, you know, in 99, it seemed to make more sense that, okay, I need a way to get my music out, so I'm going to start a record label in order to do that. I don't think that really applies anymore. So it, things are different now. But um, again, it, you know, if you're going to do it, the one thing I will advise you on, which is why I stopped the label, is that it will end up taking up so much time of your time that your music will end up kind of taking the back burner, and that's no good. Um, one, of the, one of the things we talk about a lot is the big, the age of the big distributors is done. We don't just have a Tower Records. We don't just have a few labels. You know, if people want to put their music out, they can. Um, and consequently, it's not so much about um, what everyone thinks is good as much as, oh, this works for me. This is my little niche market. Um, where do you see uh, the music industry going in the next five years? What, where do you think are the things that are really going um, really to gain traction or have you seen are getting traction? Well, you know, I, I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, what I, what I do see, though, is that there is this kind of thing developing, whether it be around labels or around just individual musicians, that they're, again, not to keep hammering on this, but there's these communities that are developing. So it's less about these big industry silos telling us what's important and what we should be interested in, or just even just providing it for us and having the media just drown us in it so that we just automatically just, you know, become zombies and say, yes, this is what's interesting now. I mean, I think there's so many ideas in the world that um, somehow, through technology, we're able to all kind of find the place that we want to be. We, we have the way to find the little world that we want to live in. So whether it be you know, New Orleans-style music or um, noise music or jazz or whatever, even within each of those categories, there's all these little subcategories now that can totally exist and are sustainable. And, you know, people are making a living in these worlds. And so the fact that these worlds can exist um, is a really great thing. And I think that's just going to continue to flourish to the point where, you know, we don't have the big names anymore that are created. Um, and when I say big names, I mean the names that we all recognize. Um, I think the, the media is going to have a hard time keeping up with um, what's really important. I mean, even now, like, there's, uh, does anybody in here know who Bob Lefsitz is? Yeah. So, I mean, he talks a lot about the, these kind of one-hit wonder people who are, you know, I mean, they're, they're billionaires now because they've released a song and they're, you know, they're, they're the name right now. They're who everyone is watching, so to speak. Um, and a year from now, we'll, we won't even remember them. 
because there's going to be somebody else that's taken their place. Now, compare this to the 70s when you had all these big names who still to this day are probably influences on all of us. I mean, that's just, that's done. It's not going to happen anymore. I mean, Lady Gaga isn't going to be inspiring people in the year 30,000 or whatever, you know. I mean, it's... That's right. <laughs> Um, we're going to open the floor for student questions, but I was wondering if you could, you know, here we are, a bunch of young minds who are going to be unleashed in the music industry maybe as early as next year and the next couple of years. Um, what are some things from, from your experience that we should know about? If there's some, there's some parting wisdom that when, when we leave this program, when we leave this building, oh, that's right, John Mueller told me. I just want to say, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to the school or the music program, but do what you're doing as good as you can and make it as personal as you possibly can. If it's not real, just go do something else. If you can't find a way to work with an instrument or music or what have you in a way that really, really comes from who you are and what you're about and what you're doing, you just probably shouldn't do it because there's so many people out there doing it that we just, the world doesn't need it. So, I mean, really take it seriously. Um, and I know that's, that's hard to kind of get your head around as, as a young person. I mean, for me it was, um, I was directionless for most of my life. But um, I think, you know, the point I'm at now, it's I've finally found a place where I feel like what I'm doing really is about me and really about my interest in what I'm doing. And, that is, I can honestly say that life is great. And unless if you're there, um, I don't think life is so great. So just be very conscious of, of, of that. And um, don't mess around with something that you don't have your heart in. The hard advice from John Mueller. There it is right there. You heard it up for him. <laughs> do, we, uh, do we have any questions? Anyone on the floor? Thought I saw one earlier. There it is. Thanks for mentioning uh, home tapes. I just checked out their Tumblr and everything. I'm really into all the tape labels, so that was really cool to see. Ah, shout out, shout out for home tapes. <laughs> any other, uh, any other questions? Yeah, it's, it's sort of creepy. I deactivated it, and instantly I got an email saying, anytime you want to come back, just log in with your login. So I'm oh, like, no. I'm thinking like, you know, it's 2025, and I can just go log back in, and there's all my stuff. Oh, what the hell, man? That's weird. It's like a bad breakup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, again, I mean, not to, I mean, it's so weird that that's such a big deal, right? You know, so. I was shocked. I was shocked. I, I, st I still might, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to go back into it because um, I, I just, everything shouldn't be a commercial. And I want to figure out a way that it's, it, just, it doesn't become this commercial for me. And I don't want to feel like that's my spot where, oh, I have to go put my announcement on Facebook now because that's just what everybody does and that's what I have to do. I don't want to feel like it's a part of my job. I want it to be more about, like, people that I really know. So, like, Probably how I'll use Facebook is if I haven't met you and talked to you in person, I'm not, you, you don't, we don't need to do anything on there. You know? Like, go to, find me on Twitter. <laughs> like human friends right. would be Facebook friends. Right, right. Revolutionary. Yeah, I, I thought of that because it was, one of the reasons why I left it is because it was getting this like insane, every day there was like just all day long these, uh, friend requests, and I mean, I don't, I don't know any of these people. You John's know. very popular. But no, but it, gets... well, it was a weird thing. Like that's what I mean. I, I, I doubted it was because of some kind of interest in my work. I think it was just people going to other people's friends lists and just adding everybody's friend, which I think is what started to happen with MySpace, when it ju it just turns into this really whorish, gross world of just promotion hell, you know. So. Yeah, I, I just, I need to kind of make, figure out a way to make it more personal. So I, I've considered that, and I, I don't know if like giving up the, the whorish aspect of it is going to hurt me in the end, but I, I doubt it, you know. Any other questions? 
a year. There we are. My question was, uh, you talked about the community building. That's the most important thing. I agree with you, but I'm wondering what your mechanism is for your personal use. What, what do you actually use to build that community? Well, you know, like John mentioned, the, my, my own site, um, and community is a weird word. I mean, when, community, when you say it, it sounds like, you know, I've got this, like, pool of people that I just always have interaction with or something. And it's, it's not so much that. It's just kind of um, using online tools to um, let people who are paying attention know about what I'm into and what I'm about. And so that, again, just doesn't mean, you know, very concretely what it is I'm doing, what, what activities I have going on, but it's about like um, a dream I had last month or um, what I think about page 36 of this book I read recently and what that means to the, you know, my life in the greater scheme of things and things like that and, and um, uh, interviewing other people and, and featuring those on my site and then obviously using things like Twitter to direct people to that. So now you have you know, if I do an interview with so-and-so and I post it on my website and then I announce that on Twitter that there's an interview with so-and-so, it's not about me. It's not just, you know, me spamming about what it is that I'm doing and people getting tired of that. So you're attracting this whole other group of people, potentially, that are going to go to the site then, find, you know, read this article that they're interested in and then, you know, presumably say, what is this place? oh, there's all this other stuff here that seems kind of curious too, so let me explore and check all this stuff out. And then, you know, uh, the, the situation that it creates is that that's how they discover um, what it is that I'm doing. And then not only what I'm doing, because I don't think that's enough anymore, I think just people kind of getting led to a, a blog or website and then discovering that the person whose site it is has a, a CD for sale, that doesn't mean they're going to go buy that, because who cares, you know? But if your site then kind of gives this overview of who you are and what you're really about and the kind of stuff that you're thinking and what your whole kind of philosophy is around what you're doing, that possibly has a better chance of making somebody say, you know what, I don't understand a lot of what, you know, I, don't, I don't really get what this guy's music is all about, but I'm curious enough to take a chance and I'm going to try it. And I'm pretty sure that that's happened. Um, I just, I, I have to assume that that's the case. I mean. For the amount of music that I sell on my site, I mean, I, I just, there's got to be, you know, I guess there's no way to know, but there's got to be a percentage of those people who are just taking a chance. You know. Any other questions? Well, John, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone.